Good. Well, okay. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. And I wanted to start today's session by reminding you of the outline of this lecture series. What we covered so far is maybe the most important thing you should know in this whole field of foundations of quantum mechanics, which is Bell's inequalities. Why are they so important? Well, because once you have Bell inequalities and the corresponding experiments, you learn that nature cannot be described by the most reasonable kind of theories uh, that look like classical physics that you could hope uh, could underpin quantum mechanics, namely local hidden variable theories. So these are out the window, they don't work. And that's very important to know because otherwise for everything else we discuss, you could get the impression, well, this is all so mysterious and there are so many puzzles, but let's just wait and see until we have found the classical type theory underlying quantum mechanics and then all my puzzles will be resolved. So now we know that this is not the case. What we will now move to is measurement because the measurement process is of course one of the big central parts of quantum physics. And so that's what we want to discuss next. Now, I want to start by discussing the basic features of the measurement process. And here I will start with a prototypical measurement. That was the first one that showed people a true quantum measurement with discrete outcomes, and that is measuring spin. So the stern gerlach experiment. Now, I've already drawn for you the setup. What this is, is really a kind of magnetic setup where the idea is you have produced a magnetic field and I will now draw the field lines. But if you look very closely, these field lines, they are curved and they are more concentrated at the top end. And that's very important because it also means the field is higher towards the top. So as there will be a position dependent field and that's central to the whole thing. Now, um, just to fix the coordinate system, the direction of the magnetic field pointing upwards, that's the Z axis for me. And now you can send in a particle that has a spin pointing in an arbitrary direction, in a superposition of up and down, if you like. And uh, then what you see is that if you follow the trajectory of this particle, if it had spin up, it might end up in the upper part. If it had spin down, it will be deflected downwards. And there's nothing in between. That's the amazing thing. So if you analyze this experiment uh, classically, you would expect that if you send in spins of random orientation, then you would uh, observe outcomes that would fall all the way between the two extremes. But this is not the case. This is absolutely not the case in quantum physics. You only observe these two discrete outcomes. And it was a big surprise when this was first discovered experimentally. So uh, what I want to do now is to describe, to, to really take our time to describe this mathematically because it's so prototypical. Whatever modern experiment and quantum measurement you're going to do, like for example, measuring a qubit using an electrical current or measuring a qubit using a beam of microwaves uh, whose transmission through some cavity does depend on the state of the qubit. Anything of that sort is essentially mathematically on the most basic level, the same as the stern gerlach device. So what we are really interested in is the fact that we have um, interaction between the spin and the position and that is brought about by this position dependent magnetic field. So if I want to write down the Zeeman energy of my spin, I would do something like, well, a magnetic field multiplied by the magnetic uh, dipole moment. Now the magnetic dipole moment itself, I should consider to be an operator since it depends on the spin of the particle and that's a quantum particle, so it's a quantum spin. And now to make my life easy, I can assume that 
at least where the particle will be going, this magnetic field is pointing along the Z direction. So we already know the direction. And so uh, what we have in the end is the Z component of the magnetic field multiplied by the Z component of the magnetic moment. Now, what is that? Well, that's some magnitude that depends on the internal details of the spin particle times uh, sigma Z, if we consider a spin one half particle. So sigma Z is one of the Pauli matrices and we will consider spin one half. The other important ingredient is that, as I just said, the magnetic field does depend on position. And in our case, we will assume it only depends on the Z coordinate. That's as shown in the picture. So the magnetic field becomes more intense as you go towards larger Z. And so I can, for example, assume that if I were to spell out the dependence on Z, we would have some overall constant contribution. Let's just call it B. Uh, plus some gradient, let's call it B prime. B prime tells me how fast B changes in the Z direction. And so now I'm in a position to write down the full Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian will depend both on the position and the momentum that go together, but also on the spin. And so that makes this uh, system already interesting. What is the Hamiltonian? Well, the Hamiltonian contains the kinetic energy, of course. And now I should be a little bit careful. I should tell you that I will, I will consider only the motion along the Z direction because that's the direction along which the magnetic field changes. That's the important part in the story. That is what is coupled to the spin. We also, of course, have motion along, say, the X direction, if that is where the trajectory uh, of the particle is going. But that's less important because just like in classical physics already, that's just free motion. That's not the kind of motion that is coupled to the spin. So let's just focus on the Z component. And so also my momentum that I'm talking of here is actually the Z piece of the momentum. So minus I H bar D over DZ. So the typical formula that you know. And then I just have to add to that the Zeeman energy, the magnetic energy that I just discussed. And it comes with two contributions corresponding to these two contributions to the magnetic field. So the first one would be the constant contribution. Let's collect all the constants here and then it's multiplied by sigma z. And then there is the contribution that describes the gradient. And that's more interesting because you see that this contribution, uh, it couples. It couples the spin and the position. And that will be essential for our story. That is the reason why eventually the spin direction can determine where the particle lands. Okay. So now what do we do with this? Um, first, there's an interesting way to physically interpret this uh, gradient term. So we could uh, say the minus mu b prime sigma z times z that's just the gradient term again i could also say aha this expression in the hamiltonian as part of the energy has a form that i can recognize why well because i could say this first part looks like a force that will be multiplied by the position force times distance gives me energy so i could say this is just force times um, position. And the funny thing is that this force is actually, if you like, so to speak, a quantum force because it does depend on the spin. So we have a spin dependent force. And that's the secret of the whole thing uh, that depending on the spin, there will be a force pointing up or down, dragging the spin upwards or downwards. Okay, fine. So um, if I want to write my Hamiltonian down again, I would have the kinetic energy. Then I would have this term that doesn't depend on the position, uh, only on sigma z. And I could always uh, try to write this in a form like this, which is just to say, aha, this is a spin in a magnetic field pointing along the z direction. If I write it like that, omega will turn out to be pr the precession frequency of the spin. So that's a kind of trivial part. But then there is the 
force term. And so we would have, um, we would have some, say size of the force, let's call it F zero times sigma Z times Z. Yeah. And so it's this part that will give me the measurement. This is the part that couples spin in position. F zero is just um, all these components. Okay, good. So far so good. And now we have to follow the time evolution of a quantum state. What will be the initial state? Well, it will be a state that lives in a Hilbert space that talks about both spin and position. And initially we will assume that there's the spin and independently of that is the wave function for the position in real space. Whenever I say independent, of course, quantum mechanically, this means that the wave function should be treated like a product wave function. So we would say the initial state psi at time zero, that is just a spin part and then product with another part that only relates to the position. Now, the spin part, well, we are talking of a spin one half system. So the most general wave function would contain two contributions, one for up, one for down, and I can take an arbitrary superposition. Alpha and beta will be complex numbers. The squares add up to one. This is my spin state. And then there's the motional state, and I don't at this point even want to assume anything about it. I will just give it a name and I will call it chi zero. So that's the emotional state. And to have something in concrete in mind, you could say, aha, uh -huh, if I draw the wave functions uh, chi zero along the z-axis, uh, then it maybe something like a wave packet. So it's spread out a little bit, but nothing special. So that's the state of affairs at the beginning of time. And now we want to see what happens. And what helps us is that this Hamiltonian only contains sigma z. That will make things much, much easier than otherwise possible. Because whenever the Hamiltonian acts on spin up or spin down in the z basis, that's just an eigenstate, so it will be reproduced. That will make things very simple. And there's a special name, which I can already mention now, for such a um, Hamiltonian, where the operator that you try to measure, in this case, the sigma z, really commutes with the Hamiltonian. So we observe that uh, sigma z commutator with h is actually zero. They both commute. There is no sigma x or sigma y terms. And so uh, such a kind of measurement is a little bit special. It's called quantum non-demolition measurement. That does not mean that nothing happens during the measurement. We will certainly see that the original superposition of the spin states is in some sense destroyed as it should be during a measurement. But it means that nothing else goes on. The spin is not scrambled additionally as it would be if the Hamiltonian would also depend on sigma x and sigma y. Okay, so that's the setting. We have the wave function, we have the Hamiltonian. All that's left to do is calculate the time evolution. And as I promised, that's actually not so difficult to do here. So what's the time evolution? Well, fortunately, this Hamiltonian is not even explicitly time dependent. I don't have a driving force that depends on time. So I can just apply the time evolution operator in the form e to the i over h bar Hamiltonian times time to the initial state. That's what you always do when Hamiltonian is time independent. And now, well, I can just pull apart the two pieces of my wave function 
namely the piece that goes with alpha and the piece that goes with beta. If I consider the piece that goes with alpha, that's an up state multiplied with the original motional state. And I will apply to that uh, my time evolution operator. And likewise for beta. And now comes the big simplification, you see, because I already told you that if I apply the Hamiltonian to say the up state, the up state will be reproduced since the Hamiltonian only depends on sigma z. Up in the z direction, the up state in the z direction is actually an eigenstate. And so that allows me a very drastic and important simplification. The up state is not altered, is not changed. And so I can actually pull it in front of the time evolution operator, but at the expense of changing the time evolution operator into something else, namely, I should now consider the Hamiltonian where sigma z has been taken to be plus one. And I will call this h up. And then I can write down the same for beta. And now again, what is this magic H up? This is just the Hamiltonian when I have inserted sigma z equals one, when I start to treat sigma z like a number because it has acted on an eigenstate, namely the up state. And so wherever sigma z appears, you can replace it by the eigenvalue that is produced, namely plus one in that case. So h uh, acting on up is really the same as h up acting on up and h up is really the same as h where I have replaced sigma z the operator by plus one, the eigenvalue of the operator everywhere. That's of course a general scheme. Yeah? If I apply an operator to an eigenstate, then it gets uh, replaced by the number that is the eigenvalue. And in this particular case, it's even a little bit more subtle because this operator H of course can act both on the spin part of the Hilbert space as well as on the motional part. Only the spin part gets replaced by a number, sigma z gets replaced by a number the emotional part still remains an operator. So that's the idea here. Okay, good. And so now that has helped us tremendously because now you see, aha, there is this piece appearing and also that piece appearing, which is the time evolution of the motional state under the action of a specific Hamiltonian, namely the Hamiltonian in one case with the sigma z part replaced by plus one and the other case replaced by minus one. And now before we calculate what happens there, at least we can give names, we can give labels, we can call this time evolved motional state, time evolved under the action of h up or h down. We can call, we can give this a name and we might call it chi up or chi down. That's the idea. Okay, so let's do this. So we would have alpha times up product state with chi up plus beta times the down state product with chi down. And of course, as I said, chi up would be the time evolved version of the original state and the same for chi down. So now that makes everything much, much simpler. And I now want to write down uh, specifically these important Hamiltonians. So as I just said, you just replace a sigma z by plus or minus one, and then you get, well, the kinetic term doesn't change. That's always the same, but you get plus or minus all the parts that depend on sigma z. There was the precession part that was simple. And there was the, um, there was the, um, part that depended on the position. And so 
if we want to summarize it physically, what we now have is that, um, for example, H up really corresponds to a force pointing in the positive Z direction. If you look at the signs and are careful about it, you see it's pointing in the positive Z direction. And so chi up will have been the motional state that evolves under the influence of something pulling it uh, along the positive uh, Z direction. So you could say, uh -huh, this is motion under a force either plus for up or minus for down um, F0. So that's one thing. What are these states? The other thing is, if we just look at the global structure of this whole state, that's also pretty interesting because this is the type of structure that we've seen before. We've seen it all the time in Bell's inequalities. Uh, this is an entangled state. Why? Because it can no longer be written as a product state, unlike the form of the state in the beginning where it was indeed a product state because spin and position were still independent. So psi is really an entangled state. And that has many consequences. There's also a name, by the way, for these chi states, chi up or chi down. Because you see, you can view the spin as a microscopic quantum system and you can view these states, chi up or chi down, as states of, well, the position coordinate that have evolved in the presence of spin up or spin down. And if you consider the position as part of the measurement apparatus in the sense that eventually the observation of the position will teach you whether the spin was up or down, if you, view, if you view the position as part of the measurement apparatus, uh, then you can call these states pointer states. That's, that's the typical jargon in this field. Why pointer states? Because like in a classical analog a measuring device that has a scale and, and a pointer, you will in the end have the pointer pointing, say either to the left or to the right, indicating the result of the measurement. And it's the role of these motional states, chi up or chi down, to indicate to you uh, the direction of the spin. So that's why they are called pointer states. Okay, so we can also visualize everything, for example, by drawing how chi up and chi down look like. So let me draw the z-axis. And I first draw the initial motional state. That's, for example, a Gaussian type uh, wave packet. And now we already know that chi up, for example, evolved under the action of a force pointing upwards. That's because of the magnetic field gradient dragging the spin towards uh, higher Z values. And so we might end up with a wave function that indeed sits further up. So that would be chi up of Z. On the other hand, if you are spin down, you're being dragged downwards. So we get a chi down. Okay, so this is what happens. You go up or down. And um, what happens during this process is obviously the two wave packets get further and further apart. Now, this is true with respect to their distance, the distance of the uh, center of mass of the wave packets. So, but also it is true with respect to the overlap of these quantum states. And that's even more important for our discussion. So if you were to take the scalar product of chi up and chi down and say take the magnitude because it's a complex number how would this look like in the course of the time evolution well first of course you start at one at first 
both of these states are actually equal to chi zero, you have 100% overlap, no problem. And then as they go further apart, their overlap diminishes. And if you really work it out carefully, it basically diminishes uh, like, a, uh, well, like uh, something like a Gaussian or similar. So the overlap diminishes, and that's very important because it becomes more and more clear just by looking at the position measurement, eventually, what was the initial spin state. That's very important. And when the overlap is zero, then in principle, all the information that was there in the spin state has been completely transferred to the position. Okay, fine. But now I've talked a lot about how this looks in principle. Let's try to solve it in practice. Let's really try to apply this kind of Hamiltonian for up or for down uh, to the motional wave packet and let's see what happens. Oh, um, oh yes, the same overlap could be drawn as a function of x uh, if you, you say were to define uh, x as the position along the original direction of motion because since this is a ballistic motion, basically time and x are the same except for a scale factor, which is the velocity. So yes, you could draw it also as a function of x. Okay, so now let's... Uh, solve the whole thing in momentum space. So what happens if I have my Hamiltonian, again, p squared over 2m minus or plus f0 times z. And okay, there's the precession as well. Um, the point is if I switch to momentum space, then this becomes much easier to solve. The kinetic energy, of course, in momentum space will just be p squared over 2m. It's like a number because I'm now working along the p coordinate. And uh, you know that the position coordinate, when written in the momentum basis, becomes an operator. And it looks a little bit like the momentum operator in real space, only with a different sign, so i h bar d over d p. So that's probably something you learned during your quantum mechanics lectures. And then I would be able to consider the momentum space wave function, which is of course derived from the real space wave function by a Fourier transform. So basically you would take an integral over all z e to the minus i p over h bar z uh, chi of z. And there's an normalization. Okay, so we are now completely working in momentum space and uh, we can write down the Schrodinger equation, no big deal. So the time evolution of this momentum space uh, wave packet, I don't say here whether it's um, high up or high down, uh, insert whatever is uh, suitable, that just determines the sign. So if you, if you work things out, then the most important term that changes depending on the spin direction is the term that involves the force and it goes along with the d over dp operator and then there's the rest um, of the constant prefactors. Uh, plus extra terms which is the precession and the kinetic energy. So uh, if I delete the ih bar I would just say aha uh -huh. um, I get this kind of expression. And so this is very interesting. That's why I wanted to derive it. Uh, what you see here is the following. Uh, the time derivative equals the momentum derivative times something. So what does this mean? This means you will get a constant shift in momentum space according to what's written down here. It's like a drift in momentum space. And uh, classically speaking, it's like the time derivative of P would be what sits in front. So uh, minus or plus the force. Oh. Or rather, let me be very careful. Um, if you're careful about the sign. <laughs> 
it's plus or minus the force. As we already discussed for the upspin, it's plus for the downspin, it's minus. So what you will have is basically this wave packet moving up or down, just like we discussed before, but now you see it directly from the formulas. Um, so we can write down the solution. Uh, there's a few more steps to the calculation, but if I want to write down the solution, I would get chi tilde up or down in momentum space as a function of time equals the original chi tilde, that is the Fourier transform of chi zero, um, shifted along the momentum direction, as you expect if you apply this constant drift in momentum space. And then, not unimportantly, there's also a prefactor, which is actually a phase. Now, this phase is not completely unimportant because it also depends on momentum. And just once I will write it down for you. So if you like, you can check this whole calculation for yourself. There's a phase that has to do with the precession. So the up and downspin acquire different uh, opposite phases. That's as expected. That has nothing to do with the measurement. And then there is another term that uh, is actually momentum dependent. And that's also quite interesting. I will just write it down once. So this is what you uh, get if you work it out completely. Now, uh, what is of particular interest to us is exactly the overlap between chi up and chi down, this kind of thing that we had here. Now, fortunately, if you, want, if you calculate the overlap in real space between two wave functions, or you calculate the overlap in momentum space, would you expect any difference in result? And the answer is no, because you have just changed the basis and the overlap, that is the scalar product between two quantum states is independent of the basis. So we can exploit that. We can calculate the overlap between these momentum space wave functions. In the end, I will only be interested in the magnitude again, not any global phase. And um, you can insert the expressions up here and take the overlap. So the integral over P uh, in momentum space, and you will find the following. And that's interesting. So you will find an exponential and it will look like this. Some average uh, P that evolves in time, which I will define in a moment divided by some delta p squared, which I can also define in a moment, and then the same for x. Okay, so, so that's the formula in general. Now, what is this um, delta p is the spread in momentum of the original wave packet. So um, spread is always the expectation value of the um, deviation from the average. Okay, so that would be delta P squared. And delta X is just the um, corresponding uncertainty. So here I'm now um, already assuming, I forgot to mention that, I'm sorry. Here, in order to get this concrete calculation going, I'm already assuming that the initial state was Gaussian. I had a Gaussian wave packet for chi zero and I will then also retain a Gaussian wave packet in the course of time and that makes this calculation possible. So then we got delta P and delta X is just the position and momentum uncertainty of the initial state. And what is P bar and X bar? Now, P bar is just the time evolution of the average momentum of the center of mass of in, in momentum space. So that's the force times time. And X bar, well, what's that? That's actually the kind of time evolution of the position of a classical particle that is under the subject of this constant force. And I hope you remember that would be one half acceleration times time squared so that comes not even that comes from high school basically so f0 divided by 2m that's the uh, half of the acceleration times uh, t squared 
And so there's a very simple interpretation now of this uh, whole formula. What happens can be best visualized in phase space. So if I draw both X and P, and uh, here, if you want to be precise, uh, we could just assume we are dealing with the, um, we're drawing the Wigner density. We're drawing the Wigner density of the state and the Wigner density initially will just be a kind of a Gaussian blob uh, at the origin. I just draw one of the contour lines of this blob. And now what happens is if my spin is up, then at first the momentum will evolve in the positive momentum direction because the force is positive. Oh, sorry, I should have um, not called this X. Of course, this is Z in our notation. So P and Z. Um, so back to the story. Um, if the spin is up, the P will evolve in the positive direction. So the center of mass of the wave packet will move upwards. And then eventually you'll also notice that since you've got a positive momentum, there will also start to be motion in the Z direction. So overall uh, you get some trajectory like this. And again, uh, you have this kind of Gaussian blob. Now this is for the spin being up. And likewise, you can draw the time evolution of the Wigner density uh, once the spin is down and it's just pointing in the opposite direction. So this is what happens uh, from the viewpoint of phase space. And uh, this also is the reason why when we calculate the overlap, we see both of these terms. So um, if in phase space, you have two Gaussian blobs, two Gaussian wave packets that move apart uh, in the X or in the P direction, uh, then this is the kind of overlap uh, you see. So the overlap will get diminished the more you move apart. Uh -huh. I see some little inconsistency. I continue to say X when I mean to say Z. That's not so nice. Um, so that's delta Z, Z bar, delta Z squared. Um, and this is Z bar, just to keep it consistent. Okay, good. So we have thoroughly calculated what happens with these wave packets uh, for spin up and spin down. And so in particular, what happens when you wait long enough is that this overlap becomes very, very small. This we already indicated here, the overlap tends to zero. And that's great in a sense, because it means if you just wait long enough, depending on which spin state you had, you also get a completely different uh, position state and that will ultimately allow you to read out the spin state indirectly by looking at the position. So what does this all mean? Or let's uh, summarize this. We have really had a spin up, acting on a wave packet, will give you a trajectory for the wave packet. Now, now this is the Z direction where the trajectory is bent upwards. And then afterwards you end up with a wave packet up here. Or if it was spin down and started out at the same point, actually, you will have a trajectory that is bent downwards. And then your wave packet will end up down here. Okay. So in the previous slide, so there's a question. So in the previous slides, you also had plus minus on the last equation. Um, I guess you mean these equations. So this would be say the evolution for the up state and correspondingly the evolution for the down state would be minus. But here I only need this one definition to define my overlap. Does it make sense to speak about trajectories here? Well, I'm only speaking here to be very on the safe side, speaking about the trajectory of the center of mass of the wave packet. So what's the expectation value of Z? What's the expectation value of P? And that I'm certainly allowed to do. 
any finer resolved trajectories, like what happens behind the scenes or so uh, that we would have to discuss later. Um, so these circles, you understand, they are the contour lines of a, of a Gaussian function in a phase space. So if I wanted to draw more contour lines, I, I would have to do it like this. If I wanted to draw, draw a 2D representation, it would look like a little Gaussian hill um, uh, in the two-dimensional phase space. And then the evolution here is uh, on a parabola, if that's what you refer to. It's a parabola because one direction is just linear in time and then the other direction is quadratic in time. Okay. So now, so far so good. There's one extra remark I want to make, which is now if you don't have this magnetic field anymore, so you don't have any more any interaction between the spin and the position, then I claim the overlap will not change anymore. And that's a very important observation also for what we are going to discuss going forward. So chi up of t overlap chi down of t. In this situation where we are say at late times and the particle has really left the region of magnetic field and there's no magnetic field and especially no magnetic field gradient that couples the position and the spin, then the following happens. So, um, I would have chi down at some time t0, which is say at the end of the interaction when I fly out of the magnetic field, or I will have chi up at the same time. And if I want to look at the further time evolution, I could say, well, that's some kind of time evolution operator applied to the interval going from t0 forward until t. But the funny thing is that it will be the same time evolution operator for both a uh, spin up and spin down. Why the same? Well, because the Hamiltonian is the same. The Hamiltonian is the same because we say there is no magnetic field anymore, so it doesn't care about spin. So that's really, really, really important. So that's the first step, that if there is no interaction between the spin and the magnetic field and the position anymore, and then we have the same time evolution acting on both spin up and spin down uh, wave functions. And then as a second step, you know that for any unitary operator, if I apply it to inside a scalar product in this way, then I can say I can bring the U to the other side as a U dagger. And so that since this is a unitary, that is just one. So I just get the old overlap. And the same happens here. So if you write it down, you retain the overlap that you had at time zero. That's very important. The overlap doesn't change anymore as soon as you end, so to speak, the measurement process, as soon as you end this interaction that was responsible for creating the spin dependent force in the first place. So that will come back. Great. Now, we could be of the opinion we have understood the measurement process quantum mechanically. We have seen how the microscopic spin state can, by way of a suitable interaction, be mapped onto the position, which then can easily be observed macroscopically, so to speak, because we might easily have the particle being deflected one centimeter in one direction or one centimeter in the other direction, depending on the spin. And that's certainly one important part of the measurement process, this notion of interaction between different degrees of freedom that gives rise to the measurement. And also this notion of the overlap uh, of the two pointer states decreasing, all of that is a very, very important ingredients of the measurement process. But it's not yet everything. And to illustrate why this is not yet everything, we will briefly talk about something which I'm sure probably you already had in your quantum lectures at some point, or if not, then it's the first time. We will talk about the quantum eraser.
So what is that? Well, we start with the same kind of setup, but now I will draw it more schematically. So here we have a Stan Gerlach apparatus, the device uh, with the magnetic field pointing upwards in this case. We know there's a gradient, but I don't draw it here. And we have a spin coming in, pointing in an arbitrary direction. And now it will be deflected up or down depending on, well, whether the spin is up or down. And in case it is in a superposition, there will end up to be a superposition of up or down being deflected in one way or the other. Anyway, so we have the spin going up, and now I have to draw very carefully, or down, and these trajectories are parabolas. Okay. Now I want to do something really sneaky. Instead of letting these spin particles hit a screen where, for example, I get a little flash and I can see, oh, it's hitting the screen at the upper end, so it must have been an up spin particle. I will not do this. Instead, I will do something that tries to recombine the two trajectories. So how could this possibly work? How can I make these trajectories recombine? Well, obviously, I have, again, to apply a force. And it cannot be simply a constant force that acts in the same way on both these trajectories, because then I would just deflect both of them, for example, downwards, and that would not help in making them reconverge to the same trajectory. What I need now is, again, a spin-dependent force, but acting in the opposite way than before. How would I do this? Well, I set up another stern apparatus. So now this, I need a little bit more space. This is a stern apparatus where the magnetic field itself might still point upwards, but the gradient is in the opposite direction. So here the gradient say was positive. Now I want a Stern Gerlach apparatus that has been engineered so that the gradient is negative. Again, the magnetic field direction might still be the same, but the gradient is opposite. That's important because we know the force depends on the gradient. So the sign of the force will be reversed. So spin up will now be deflected. And um, at first, it will just slow down, slow down in the z direction, I mean, and then uh, be moving just along the x direction in the forward direction. So in the z direction, it has stopped, basically. But I want to go on with that. I want to reverse the velocity completely. So I will make this Sterngerlach apparatus twice as long as the original one. And so that helps me that I can reverse completely the velocity. So now it's going down in Z direction as opposed to up. And I can have the same for the downspin. It will also turn, first be slowed down and then turn around. And so now it goes up in the Z direction. So that's already great, but it still doesn't make the trajectories converge. If I were just to go on, these trajectories would just cross each other actually, and I would not um, have what I want to do. So what needs to be done in a final stage is to make these trajectories somehow go like those and end up with exactly zero velocity along the Z direction. That's my goal. How do I do that? Well, again, I need to apply a spin dependent force. If I think it through, it's got to be again in yet the opposite direction, which is actually the same direction as in the initial standard apparatus. And if I think it through, I also find that actually I only need the original length of the apparatus. So I have these three stages now. I have an initial stage where I split these trajectories. I have an intermediate stage where I make the velocities switch, flip their sign. And a final stage where I break the velocities down to zero. And what I end up with is, in the best case, if I do everything ideally, these trajectories will perfectly merge again. And there will be no distinction anymore in position space between the up and the down spin, 
And I can actually end up with, again, a spin, maybe even pointing in the same direction as before, as if nothing had happened. And this is the meaning of quantum eraser. I started a measurement, but then I changed my mind. I said, no, 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 I don't want to learn about the spin. Let me undo the measurement. And I was able to do this by adding these extra interaction regions. So by having chosen not to measure the position, which I could have done at this point, letting it fall on the screen, but instead having the spin and the position interact once more using these extra field gradients, I was able to reverse everything. And that's very important because it tells us, aha, at this point where I drew the dashed line, it's not so obvious at this point whether this should already be taken to constitute a measurement. In fact, it probably shouldn't because depending on what is my intention, I can now let it fall on the screen. Okay, then probably the measurement is finished, but I can also choose to undo the tentative measurement to reverse it and come back to the initial situation. And then everything is as if nothing had happened. Yeah. So we have really undone the entanglement. So what had at some point, namely at this point, been this funny entangled state that correlates the spin with the position has then finally, with this clever apparatus scheme, emerged back to be a spin state that is completely uncorrelated, meaning product state, with uh, the emotional state. And you can arrange it so that you get back really maybe the initial emotional state. Maybe it's a little bit broadened because of some uh, dispersion effects, but okay, these are details. So what we learn from this is we are still missing one crucial aspect of the measurement, and then I come to the question. One crucial aspect was still missing, and that is irreversibility. That is what we learn from this example, because here apparently we were not yet irreversible and it would be premature to conclude that the measurement has finished now. And so that needs to be the next thing that we will discuss, irreversibility. Um, so there's a question. I just don't understand why we need the last apparatus. Well, okay, yeah, let's discuss it again. That's interesting, actually. So if I hadn't had the last apparatus, what would I have then? So, so at this point, if I didn't add anything, if I continue the trajectories, these would just be ballistic trajectories. So a uh, spin up would be continuing downwards. Spin down would be continuing upwards. And although it is true in principle that you could decide to hit the screen maybe at this point, and then indeed uh, with regard to the position, there would be no difference uh, between the two cases. If you look more closely at the wave functions, you would find that you have still an entangled state. And the reason would be that chi up would be a wave packet moving down and chi down would be a wave packet moving up. So even though they are located at the same position in real space, they would have different average momentum and they would actually still be orthogonal states and you would still have an entangled wave function. So you would not have undone the entanglement. So that's why we need to take care even to reduce the velocities down to zero so that perfectly the trajectories merge. And then afterwards, there's really nothing, neither position nor momentum that can distinguish the two states. That was the reason. So you see quite a bit of effort is involved in undoing such a measurement. Okay. So now irreversible processes. That's a hugely important and super interesting topic. And, um, what do you need to have irreversible processes? Well, first, let me tell you that maybe very strictly speaking, 
there is no process that is absolutely irreversible. You could always come up with very crazy schemes to say, ah, oh, maybe this is still not completely reversible, irreversible. But uh, one fair way to make things irreversible is just to bring in more degrees of freedom, to make it ever more complicated to do things like this quantum eraser experiment. So what I want to discuss now is at least two physical examples of real measurements as they are in real life that show what is irreversible, what's going on there that makes it practically impossible for all practical purposes to reverse the measurement process. And the first example will be, well, one of the most important detectors and earliest ones uh, to be discovered, which is a photo detector, a photo multiplier. Okay, so how does a photo multiplier work? Well, we have a kind of metal plate on which a photon hits, because that's our purpose here, to detect a single photon. And what this does is it ejects a single electron. Now, already this, truth be told, uh, could be quite an irreversible process. It's very difficult to figure out a very con uh, artificial scenario where we could reverse this. But things will get much more irre irreversible even in a moment. Because what happens with this electron is you want to make sure that you can reliably detect it. A single electron, if you think of it as contributing to an electrical current, that's just such a tiny blip. It may be lost in the noise. So what you want to do is you want to have more electrons. So how do you do this? Well, a old trick, you have another metal plate that is charged to a high positive voltage, which means you accelerate your electron and it hits this other plate at a very high velocity. When it does so, it kicks out many, many more electrons, releases all of them. And so you have a kind of avalanche effect or a multiplication effect. Suddenly you have many more electrons and you can repeat this process. Even you can have another positively charged plate. You can have another crazy avalanche of even more electrons. I cannot even draw so many. So um, you can stack this uh, process in a cascade. And so what you can make sure is that a single photon triggers an avalanche of electrons, many, many electrons. And so the amplification of the signal uh, could be, for example, a million or so just to give a number. And there's many other detectors that work in a similar manner. Maybe you want to detect ions and you rip off an electron and then you do the same story and so on. So the idea is always to take one degree of freedom or one particle and convert it into many, many, many more particles. And uh, I will make a remark uh, a little bit later of on the more fundamental level why this is irreversible, but for practical purposes, uh, you can already guess that it would be very hard to construct a situation where somehow all these electrons that have been released voluntarily would reverse their direction and go back to the metal plate and then a gamma, I mean a photon being released and everything is as if nothing had happened. So that's uh, extremely unlikely to happen. So that's the photo multiplier, just a nice uh, illustration of what we mean by irreversibly, irreversibility through many degrees of freedom. And now here's an even more fantastic example. A photo multiplier is still a device. In the end, of course, you want to have an experimentalist who knows about the result of the photo multiplier. So what might happen is that at the end, maybe, uh, well, in modern times, a computer might uh, register the signal, this current signal, and then uh, record this and print something on a screen. And then the photons from the screen will hit the eyes of the experimentalist, and it's then that the experimentalist uh, really learns about the result of the measurement. And so why not also 
study this? Why not also study this visual impression as a kind of measurement device? So let's talk about the human eye. Now, how does this human eye work? Of course, it has many, many parts. I cannot claim to understand it completely, but it has one basic process. And again, there are variations of this and so on, but it has one basic process that an incoming photon can flip the shape of a molecule. So that's the basic process. And this molecule even has a name. It's called cis rhodopsin doesn't really matter. It's also just a name for me, but it's kind of some kind of organic molecule and I will sketch it in a very rough uh, uh, way. Let's say it looks like this initially. And then you have one photon hitting uh, the vicinity of this molecule being absorbed by the molecule. And what you get is the same molecule but in a different conformation, in a different structure. So what really happens is that this tail of the molecule, so to speak, uh, moves. So you have the same molecule. And now I need to be a bit careful, but essentially you have a, you have a strand that now um, looks like this. So this is the cis configuration that for any chemists out there is the trans configuration. And this is a very fast process. So that, that happens in less than 200 uh, femtoseconds. Oh, thank you, the chemists uh, approve. <laughs> well, I, I haven't drawn all the details. <laughs> okay, so um, we will in a moment talk about the further steps, but it's really interesting to see how even this step already contains irreversible elements. And so what I will plot now is something like the energy landscape of this molecule. Now, every chemist knows uh, this molecule, of course, has, is composed of many parts. All of them have coordinates. In principle, I should draw something in a very high dimensional coordinate space. I cannot do this. So I just pick one coordinate. Let's say the coordinate that tells me uh, how far this last tail of the molecule is moving, something like this. The, reaction coordinate, so some suitably chosen coordinate. And then uh, what you can have is you can draw the energy of the electronic system as a function of this um, coordinate in the molecule. So as the molecule changes its shape, also the electronic cloud has to rearrange, the energy of the electronic cloud has to change. How does this look like? Well, it turns out that in the cis configuration, let's say, maybe it looks like this. So the, the, put, the energy, the electronic energy as a function of coordinate might look like a parabola. So there's a preferred state, the equilibrium state of the molecule. That's how it looks like. And now there's the trans configuration that might actually be a little bit higher in energy. But again, around its equilibrium position, there's something like a parabola. And then there's a very interesting thing, namely where these two curves cross, um, these two electronic energy surfaces, as they call it, get mixed up. And as a consequence, you get something like this you get what we uh, would call an avoided crossing. So these are now different energy surfaces in this kind of molecule that is electronic energy as a function of coordinates of the atoms. And so now what happens is if your photon strikes, what happens if your photon strikes? Well, your original motional wave packet, let's say, was the ground state here, just looking like a Gaussian. Now the photon strikes, suddenly you move up to this other energy surface. You are however still in the same motional wave packet. So, so the motional wave packet in the first moment just after you absorb the photon is exactly the same, just like the same Gaussian. 
But now it finds itself suddenly in another energy surface. So what it does is it's no longer in the ground state. It's no longer in the equilibrium state of this new energy surface. It starts to accelerate downwards. It just wants to slide down the hill and it picks up speed. And what can happen now is the following. Either it can just, well, then go up the hill on the other side and slush back and forth a few times and oscillate. That could happen. But what can happen also is that it now couples to other, say, vibrations of this molecule or maybe vibrations of the surrounding liquid or something like this. And if it does so, it can release some energy and make a transition where actually it goes into this lower energy surface. And then finally, maybe after a few more oscillations, I don't know, it really settles down in this new equilibrium position. So intermediately, uh, I claim there was this um, emission maybe of a few phonons, vibrations to make everything irreversible, but e eventually it settles down and it is really uh, finding itself in the trans configuration. And the interesting thing is that this process happens quite efficiently using photons, but if you were to wait for it, if you just sit here and then say, ah, oh, maybe I have some thermal fluctuations, how often can it be that purely by chance, by thermal fluctuations, I cross this barrier and I go from cis to trans? Well, you might be surprised, but the spontaneous rate for this to happen is only once every 2000 years. So that's essentially never going to happen. And this is, of course, very important. Otherwise, you would constantly be seeing wrong signals in your eye. Oh, um, so someone had still a question about the previous topic, the photomultiplier. Um, the irreversibility of the photomultiplier seems to be due to sensitivity to initial conditions as in deterministic chaos. I'm not sure why this should give an intuition into the irreversibility of the quantum eraser. Um, well, the quantum eraser, of course, is not irreversible, but yes, now we want to discuss the true irreversibility in quantum measurements. And the uh, first of all, the picture you should have in mind here is we are trying or we will be trying to describe this whole process quantum mechanically. And I will come back to the more, say, formal description a little bit later. And yes, it has a lot to do uh, with exactly what you mentioned, things like sensitivity to initial conditions, the um, ch challenge of trying to make something uh, reversible, the same challenge that already is there also in classical physics. But just t stay tuned for this. Yeah. Okay, so I want to continue with the human eye story where it's maybe even more mysterious, but I, I very much like this, um, this example. Now, once this has happened and you have the this trans configuration, what goes on next? So this happens only in the first moment, 200 femtoseconds, very fast. These are the typical time scales for vibrations and so on. Or, or no, sorry, even for electronic processes and then um, it uh, is converted in this process. And then what happens next is that this different shape of the molecule will also change the structure of other molecules. It will open ion channels. The ion channels will uh, let through a current and then you have nerve pulses and then eventually gets amplified in this way and then maybe processed by your brain. So um, I'll just briefly note ion channels, etc. This is a much slower process. So this uh, takes maybe 0.1 seconds so the blink of an eye. Now there's one uh, funny thing here to mention uh, in principle, the eye would in this way really be able to detect single photons, it's that good. However, the structure of the eye or the wiring say of the nerves and so on is made in a very clever way such that a true signal is generated only for when say five photons uh, strike you within 0.1 seconds. And so that's very interesting because why would that be if you could do it better? 
And the answer is very interesting. It's something that every engineer would know who also wants to build uh, photo detectors. And the answer is simply to suppress so-called dark counts where you accidentally trigger, because some of these processes are a little bit noisy, where you accidentally trigger a signal. Okay, so you see the eye has even been engineered as a quite smart quantum detector in this sense. But now coming back to the general story, now that we have looked at the human eye. So if we want to have a first little summary and then we discuss it a little bit more deeply, we have observed a general feature in these uh, two examples, namely amplification. So we have one quantum, one particle, one photon, something like this. Uh, um, and one microscopic event, and uh, we give rise somehow to many quanta, many photons, many electrons, many degrees of freedom. So on the very practical level, this means the signal becomes very large. Because the signal becomes very large, you can much more readily pick it out of any noise that might be there. But it also makes it much more likely that your process is, for all practical purposes, irreversible. And we will discuss this in a moment in more detail. Um, before we go there, uh, let me briefly, just for comparison or contrast, discuss another case where you could say, oh, isn't that a great detector? So if I want to build a photon detector, you could say, well, okay, I know one thing. Uh, I know one thing that can absorb photons. It's an atom. It's called an atom. And so uh, you would say, aha, uh -huh. my atom is struck by a photon. The photon is absorbed. Isn't that a great photo detector? The problem with this is if your atom doesn't have any extra internal decay channels, any extra many degrees of freedom, then chances are very great that the atom cannot do anything else but actually fall back down to its ground state and re-release the photon. Now, of course, true, the photon may be released in a different direction, but at least from the point of view of the atom, it's really as if nothing has, had happened. So you cannot distinguish later by any measurement this atom, uh, initial atom, in the, being in the ground state from the final atom also being in the ground state. So here you will have to work much better uh, in order to make a detector out of an atom. People, of course, have been thinking about this. Um, for example, the atom could have a spin state. You could flip the internal spin state of the atom and then look at the spin state later. Of course, for that, again, you need an efficient uh, readout but then you are going in this direction of turning a single atom into a detector, but uh, the simple two-level atom is really too bad as a detector. So this is just a little side remark uh, of a process that is obviously too simple in order to act as a detector. Okay, so now, um, what about irreversibility? Let's discuss this a little bit better. Um, so back to irreversibility. Let me again discuss two cases just to make the contrast uh, really clear. Let's assume I want to detect the presence of an atom at some location, so or some particle, it doesn't matter. And what I could do is, of course, we already learn interaction is an important ingredient. So let me just place a little spring, a little harmonic oscillator here at this point. If the atom comes along, it will give a kick to this uh, harmonic oscillator. This harmonic oscillator will uh, start to vibrate. And there you have the beginnings of a detector. That's all fine and good, but we already have an inkling of how to erase this, of how to build our quantum eraser. Uh, what I could do is, I just place a mirror here and I reflect my atom. 
And if it comes back, and if it comes back at the right time, I might conceivably engineer it such that the renewed interaction with my harmonic oscillator would stop the harmonic oscillator just at the right time so that if it had, say, initially been in the ground state, it is again in the ground state, and it is as if nothing had happened. I, have work I haven't worked out this particular situation, but it is conceivable that you could do this. And then it would be very similar to what you did for the Stern-Gallach quantum eraser. So we all already know that you always need to have a renewed interaction with your measurement apparatus. Otherwise, as we saw, the overlap will always remain small between these two pointer states and nothing will change anymore. So you always need this extra new interaction. Uh, but then in principle, you could uh, reverse things. Okay, so that's a bad situation. Bad in the sense that I can bring in the quantum eraser concept. Now, how can I turn this into a very promising uh, detector without going into a very physical situation like the photomultiplier with its avalanche or the human eye with all this cascade and so on? That's much too complicated. Well, I already set up the story, of course. I will now also work with vibrations, but a little bit more complicated. So I could imagine here I have an atom again coming along, but now it doesn't strike a single harmonic oscillator. It actually strikes the surface of a solid, of a crystal. Think of it as many, many little atoms coupled together with springs. Here and so on, you get the point. And now what will happen when the atom strikes the surface of this crystal is of course that sound waves uh, will be generated. So I could draw these sound waves like this. Sound waves propagating outward. Technically speaking, uh, you can always represent such a crystal as a collection of harmonic oscillators. These are the normal modes, the sound wave modes, each of them being represented by a harmonic oscillator and the quantum language. If any of these modes is excited, you would say it contains a few phonons. Maybe if this atom hits the crystal really hard with a lot of energy, uh, then you will actually populate many of these modes with a few or even more phonons. So that's what happens in a quantum language. But classically, uh, what happens is really you kick it at some point and you launch this uh, big sound wave going outwards or this collection of sound waves. Now, how would you reverse this? Well, there are always two parts to it, yeah? As we just learned previously, one thing is you suddenly have to make sure that the atom comes back and has another chance at interaction with, so to speak, your measurement apparatus, which in this case would be the crystal. So that can be still, still be done. Maybe I could place a little mirror here. So if the atom hits the mirror, it will be reflected. So that can be done. Maybe it can be made to hit the crystal at exactly the same spot as before. But this is not enough because uh, typically the sound waves will have already propagated away. And if you just hit it at the same spot once more, guess what happens? You just launch new additional sound waves. You deposit even more energy into the crystal. That will not undo the measurement. So what needs to be done is something that I already indicated for the little, um, for the little harmonic os single harmonic oscillator uh, that I discussed before. Uh, the timing would have to be just right such that there's a chance that this extra interaction completely um, extracts all the energy that had been initially there in the crystal and uh, extracts it and gives it back to the atom. Can this be done? Well, very unlikely. One cannot completely exclude it because there might be situations, and we should be honest here, there might be very constructed artificial situations where you could imagine something like this happening. So imagine you have built a very carefully engineered solid just to demonstrate to your friends that you can build quantum erasers. Um, 
where the atom hits here, then the sound wave propagates outwards. It hits the carefully shaped boundary, is reflected everywhere, converges inwards, and at some point converges completely at this initial spot. And if you make sure that the timing is right and the atom hits the crystal exactly at this point of time, then I cannot exclude that if you set up everything right, you could actually undo this measurement. But there's a lots of ifs there, not only this carefully engineered shape and the careful timing, but also typically um, there is not even a single time when all the sound waves exactly converge back to this spot. And the reason is, of course, a very simple physical reason, which is dispersion. So if you look at the dispersion curve of sound waves, frequency versus K, it doesn't just look like a straight line. It looks more like something like this. It's bent. And so that means they don't have an exact uh, precise velocity, which would be the slope of this line but it's actually something like a superposition of different velocities. So there is dispersion, which means any sound wave that initially looked like a delta peak propagating outwards will actually disperse. It will uh, extend more over space. And so when it comes back, instead of having a single pulse in time that focuses all the energy, actually it now has already become a little bit extended in time. And so it's no longer like before. So even that on a very practical level, even in this very, very simple model where everything is linear, even um, we can already see how this becomes irreversible and it will become very hard to build anything like a quantum eraser. Um, so there's another question. Dispersion could also be engineered in a structured crystal. That's true actually. So phononic crystals would be an example. And so, I cannot completely exclude that if you want to impress your friends with another quantum eraser, you could actually uh, engineer it such that indeed the dispersions, let's say, is a straight line for at least a sufficiently large fraction of case uh, of, of wave numbers. And then maybe uh, details, it will really depend on the details. For example, if the uh, atom uh, coming in is not too high velocity, maybe it prefers Differentially excites phonons uh, down here, which have still uh, an almost perfect linear dispersion relation. And then maybe you're better off. Um, again, I haven't gone through the details, but you see all the things that, have, that would have to come together. And so how this looks like in practice, in actual practice, um, is actually much more something like this. So what happens in a real crystal that has not been engineered to uh, to, to demonstrate uh, to the world what you would have, you, what you would have, and it's nice to, to write your own little simulation to do this, and it's enough to do the classical simulation. You first have waves propagating outwards, and then once they hit the boundaries, uh, now I need to be careful. <laughs> um, you actually get them reflected back like this. And uh, eventually, it really becomes a mess. And even classically, even don't talk about quantum mechanics, um, you wouldn't be able generically uh, to get them all back, converge back uh, to the initial spot. You could, in principle, if you had a magic device uh, which gave you some time reversal, do this. So what is time reversal? Well, uh, classically speaking, it, it would just mean that you take all the velocities and suddenly, instantaneously, magically, you replace them by minus the velocity. And then if you have a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian, so no magnetic field, just the usual interactions and kinetic energy and so on, uh, then uh, whatever happened before will be exactly reverted. The movie will run backwards. And if before you got into the scrambled mess of sound waves propagating around in your crystal, you could, in principle, having this magic device make everything converge back. The problem is a little bit, a time reversal is not something easy to engineer. So uh, classically speaking, of course, uh, what you could do is uh, 
you just, at least conceptually, you go in there, you measure all the billion velocities of these atoms in the crystal and you by hand, so to speak, by cleverly applying forces and kicks, uh, you will reverse each a single, every single velocity. So that could be an option classically if you had infinite resources to build this. But quantum mechanically, it's even worse. So quantum mechanically, the true time reversal operation is something where you take the wave function, and now I'm already writing down a multi-particle wave function, yeah, because that's what we're after, and you take its complex conjugate. Why is this a time reversal? Well, uh, if you had any, say, plane waves uh, initially, like e to the ikr, then they will be replaced by e to the minus ikr, so the momentum has flipped around, and this is even true if you have a superposition of plane waves or something more complicated with a more um, positions, r1, r2, and so on. So uh, this is how a time reversal in quantum mechanics looks like. Unfortunately, this is not a unitary operation. So there is no physical unitary operation that can affect such a time reversal. And so that's somehow out of the question. Okay, so because otherwise that would be great if you had such a time reversal, uh, reversal available, no matter how chaotic and complicated the dynamics, whether you have a dispersion or even nonlinear interactions, you wouldn't care. You would just apply the time reversal, wait for the sufficient time, be sure that everything reconverges, make it interact again with the original particle, with the atom, and uh, you could undo everything and you could build a universal quantum eraser, but you can't. Okay, maybe last uh, remark before we stop today. Again, still the same topic. Um, if you, let's consider the following situation. I, I have a situation where um, I have a wave function, let's say in a single harmonic oscillator, I gave a kick to this wave function. I watch its time evolution as it sloshes back and forth. Um, and I will now look at something very simple, namely what's the overlap of the time evolved state with the initial state. And so if I had a single oscillator, that would be quite simple because you see it's a periodic motion and every once in a while, that is uh, every once in a period, I recover exactly the initial state. So it's completely uh, re uh, reversible and periodic. Um, just a moment and then I'll ask, answer the question. So um, that's what I, what I would uh, see for the uh, single harmonic oscillator. So a periodic revival as they call it. But before I go on and describe how the same thing happens for many degrees of freedom, there was an interesting question. So time reversal is a dissipative dynamics. Yes, indeed, yes, and congratulations. So I described it in classical terms as saying, okay, you could do a precise measurement, which is possible in classical mechanics. And then you would go in there with your forces and uh, reverse everything. But if you want to set up something that is as close as possible to time reversible, to time reversal, at least in specific degrees of freedom, yes, you need to have them interact with other degrees of freedom and dissipation will necessarily come into play. So you can have something that looks a little bit like time reversal, reversal also in quantum mechanics, but only by introducing extra degrees of freedom and thereby introducing dissipation. Yeah, so that's true. Um, is, free part, is free particle spreading reversible? Um, also a very good question. And uh, the answer is yes. So if you, if you take a wave packet and then you let it spread, um, what you need to do is just to apply just the right potential later in time. That is a potential, a harmonic potential, in fact, 
would suffice, I believe, uh, which would, so to speak, <laughs> try to push back um, everything and let it reconverge to the origin. In fact, um, you see something like this for uh, harmonic oscillators. That's another very interesting story. So let me, let me draw a little picture for harmonic oscillators. Um, I'm now drawing the wave function of a harmonic oscillator, which has been prepared not in the ground state. Let's say the ground state has uh, this extent, but it has been uh, prepared in a much more, much more compact state uh, localized on a smaller ra uh, range, a so-called squeezed state in the context of harmonic oscillators, but it doesn't matter. So it's a very compact state. It has a very large momentum uncertainty, however, so it will spread very quickly, will spread very quickly. And then the harmonic potential, however, will, so to speak, make it turn around. So I'm drawing like classical trajectories, but you can imagine doing the full wave function calculation. And then what you will see is that at a later point in time, everything will reconverge back to exactly the same initial state wave function, which was very compact and concentrated at the origin. So these are, this is the dynamics of squeezed states and harmonic potential, but there you can see how this initial spreading, which actually is this exactly the same as you would have for a free particle, can be undone in the right way. But of course here, um, you knew this was a very simple system, just a single harmonic oscillator. Okay, so maybe um, coming back to what I wanted to say, uh, one, one important quantity to look at this in this discussion, reversible versus irreversible dynamics, is this overlap between the initial state and the state at a later time. If this overlap has uh, revivals like the one shown here for the harmonic oscillator, then there is some chance you just need to get your timing right, but you knew but you know at this point in time, you will be back to the initial state. And maybe if that was part of a measurement initially, uh, you have a chance of undoing the measurement. But now if you have a few oscillators, the curve looks much more complicated. It will actually, uh, well, could look like this. I'm, I'm not completely sure, but that's already very unlikely that you go back to 100%. And if you take the limit of infinitely many oscillators, the infinitely many normal modes of a large crystal lattice, then what you will see is that this overlap very quickly goes to zero, and then it will stay at zero for all times. So that's how in this context, in this quantity, a reversibility looks like. Okay, I guess this is a story we will continue next time. It's a very interesting piece of physics, but is there still any question for today? Okay, I, I just want to tell you that the next two weeks will be break and we continue January 11. Also, I want to point out that we will still hopefully produce a new uh, problem set uh, still before Christmas and then you can try to do it over the break and then sometime in January, we will announce another um, problem set tutorial. Okay, then everyone have nice holidays, stay healthy and safe and have a good new year.